East Ukraine, March 2023. Anton huffed and puffed, reaching the truck a second before the driver threw it into gear, hauling himself up in the back just in time. All around him, similar trucks were already in motion or waiting with idling engines, their drivers yelling at the rushing soldiers to hurry up and load in. As if to punctuate the point, there was a high-pitched whine in the distance, followed by an explosive blast. Russian artillery was in range and opening up. This wasn't the first time he had to retreat during the course of the 13-month war for his country, but this was perhaps the most painful retreat. For over a year, Ukraine and Russia had slugged it out in a bloody battle for eastern Ukraine. Both sides had advanced and retreated under the weight of each other's offensives. Toward the end of last summer, though, Ukraine had made its greatest gains, liberating the city of Kherson in late September. It felt as if the tide of the war had finally shifted. And then the U.S. midterm elections came around. In a wholly unprecedented turn of events, a slew of isolationist politicians had been voted into office. The House of Representatives had quickly put forth a measure to end U.S. membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, believing it to be a waste of resources when a real threat to America was in the Pacific, namely China. Pressure on the Senate led to landmark legislature, and with the stroke of a pen, the United States was no longer a member of NATO. This had direct implications for Ukraine's war against Russia. With no more investment in Europe, the United States was no longer as interested in hemming in Russian aggression, and thus funding for the Ukrainian armed forces quickly dried up. Along with the money came an end to millions of rounds of ammunition, harm anti-radar missiles, new artillery, and of course, the vaunted HIMARS system, which had enabled Ukraine's first and only major offensive at the end of August last year. Ukraine was now a European problem, and Europe's support for the Ukrainian armed forces was a fraction of what it had enjoyed from the United States. The new slew of American politicians represented a shift in attitude from the American taxpayers. Russia was Europe's problem. Problem is, Europe was ill-prepared to deal with the problem, and Anton and his comrades were suffering for it. It was hard to tell which had been the most devastating for his country's war effort, the lack of direct material support or the lack of intelligence support. Before, his country had enjoyed the wealth of information offered by America's vast intelligence gathering apparatus, everything from human intelligence sources to satellite and electronic intercepts, all of it feeding targeting data to eliminate Russian VIPs and intelligence preventing Russian surprise assaults or reinforcements. Ukraine had enjoyed a nearly real-time view on Russian movements. Now that intelligence was reduced to a trickle, the army was largely fighting blind. But the lack of material support hurt too. Surviving HIMARS units no longer had ammunition, and work was being done to try to convert them to fire more available and less capable unguided rocket munitions. The supply of manned portable air defense weapons had all but evaporated, leaving the frontline troops vulnerable to air attack as they once were at the start of the war. Russian tanks could now operate with greatly reduced fear from anti-tank missile threats, as the US had provided the bulk of Ukraine's anti-armor capabilities via its Javelin ATMs. For Anton, the decision for the US to withdraw from NATO and from Europe itself meant he was in retreat once more, but this time it felt much more final. NATO Headquarters, Brussels, Belgium The Ukrainians were taking a beating, now in general retreat across the east. Major General Alex Tuvich shook his head sadly, reading the intelligence reports in his hand. The U.S. was still tasking satellites, ELINT, and human sources in the war in Ukraine, but it just wasn't sharing that information anymore. A damn stupid move on the politician's behalf, thought the general to himself. With a sigh, he fed the report to the Specialized Disposal Unit for sensitive documents. It was the last piece of hardware in what was his former office inside NATO headquarters as a special attaché to the organization which had lasted for eight decades, but was now in serious jeopardy of collapse. He waited to confirm the disposal unit did its job with the hum of energy. It flash incinerated the document, leaving behind only ashes. He knew its job was done when he could smell the slight aroma of burning paper. He wouldn't bother sending an aide for the device, the Euros could have it, along with his empty office. General Tuvich stood and took in one last look at what was once one of the cornerstones of American global strategy, then turned his back on the office and 80 years of highly successful foreign policy and walked out the door. He was met by his aide and driver. There was a waiting U.S. Air Force passenger plane at the nearby military airfield, which would return him to the U.S. via Britain, as America and the U.K. still maintained a security alliance. U.S. forces and bases there weren't being deactivated as they were across mainland Europe. As he passed within a few doors of one of the General Assembly meeting rooms, he could hear the Latvian representative practically screaming at his NATO partners. He didn't blame them. Since the U.S. announced its withdrawal from the alliance, Russia had reinforced its eastern flank along the Baltics. It was all but a certainty that Russia would attempt to intimidate the breakaway Soviet republics into returning to the fold. He wondered if they would actually use force, though, and what the hell Europe would do about it if they did. 
As he turned the corner, he was greeted by Lieutenant Colonel Beaumont de Champ, one of France's representatives here at Brussels headquarters. The two had enjoyed a close working relationship, and he quite liked the man. He barely even held the fact that he was French against him anymore. For his part, de Champ ignored that Tuvich's favorite meals typically included hamburgers of some sort. De Champ fell in alongside Tuvich, speaking in a thick Alsatian French accent. Your government could have at least left us with logistical support. I agree, damn foolish of the politicians, but… Tuvich shrugged his shoulders. Americans got tired of paying the bills for European security. The Champ bristled at the comment, yet he couldn't deny there was at least some truth to this. His own nation was only 0.07% away from meeting the alliance's minimum funding goal of 2% GDP and had only increased spending in recent years under intense pressure from the US. What is that American expression? The matter is soon to hit the fan? Major General Alex Tuvich nodded solemnly. Yes, my friend, the Merd is in fact about to hit the fan. Satsa, Estonia. Twelve Mi-8 helicopters of the Russian Aerospace Forces crossed the border into Estonia, flying just barely over the rooftops of the neighboring town of Satsa. The helicopters sat down at pre-planned positions around the western perimeter of the town, disgorging their squads of Russian paratroopers. A few minutes later, a force of Russian T-90s and BTR-80s overran the border police checkpoint, smashing through the flimsy wooden barricade. There was a brief exchange of gunfire with some Estonian border troops, but within six hours, the small town was firmly under the control of the Russian military. From the town square, the Russians had hung their country's flag. 10 Downing Street, United Kingdom The British Prime Minister did her best to hide her concern. Arrayed before her on multiple screens were the leaders or representatives of the remaining members of the NATO alliance. The emergency conference had been called immediately upon reports of the first Russian troops crossing into Estonian territory. In the last six hours, the Russians had secured the small town, and the new satellite reconnaissance seemed to indicate that they were digging into defensive positions. Estonia had attempted to fly several drones over the area, but they had all been shot down, so live intelligence was out of the question. However, it didn't seem as if the Russians had any intention of advancing their attack. The Prime Minister realized she'd been asked a question and snapped out of her internal mental review. I'm sorry, what was that? The representative from the Estonian government was on the main screen, looking understandably frustrated. Ma'am, I'm going to ask you again, will Britain honor its commitment to NATO's NRF? And that was a question with a million implications. She could feel the weight of history pressing down on her. The fate of Europe in the 21st century very much depended on her answer. NATO's response force and very rapid response force had been set up to deal with exactly this type of Russian incursion. It was well known that for at least a decade, Russia's Vladimir Putin had toyed with the idea of a fait accompli attack against NATO. The seizure of a single meaningless village somewhere along the Baltics, not enough to warrant full-scale war in normal circumstances, but enough to test the NATO alliance. If NATO hesitated, the entire concept of mutual defense collapsed and the alliance would inevitably splinter, exactly as Putin wanted. Despite his catastrophic setbacks in Ukraine, which were now being reversed, America's exit from the alliance had given him exactly the opportunity he'd been dreaming of. He didn't even wait for America to fully leave the continent. European command still had several dozen planes waiting to be loaded with equipment in airfields across Germany. The PM looked over at the screen with the Turkish representative. Turkey had been striding a fine line between Europe and Russia for years now, but had so far seemed to be committed to the alliance in regards to assisting Ukraine. However, the incursion into Estonia had put Turkey in a position where it finally had to decide who it really wanted to be friends with and faced the prospect of fighting Russia without US aid. Well, she could already see the answer on the man's stony face. It wasn't that NATO without America wasn't a match for the Russian military, it's that the US provided the very backbone of what a modern army needs to win a fight. Transportation, logistical support, and special mission aircraft. U.S. firepower was considerable and nice, but it was the loss of U.S. logistics and support assets that made a response to Russia's incursion difficult. The alliance had scrambled to shore up its deficiencies since the U.S. announced its surprise exit, and the response and very fast response forces were at least fully equipped. But those couldn't win a war on their own. They were meant to deter a war, not stop one in progress. Russia had called NATO's bluff, and without US air power and intelligence immediately available to the alliance, it would take weeks to coordinate an effective response from the varying military powers. Britain was having trouble even keeping its current ships fully manned, and had already cannibalized a few vessels of their crews in the last 10 years just to keep others operational. Germany struggled to fully equip its commitment to NATO's response force, having to borrow equipment from other units to do so, and its air force hadn't been considered fully ready for combat for years now due to maintenance and logistical problems. She scanned the faces of the NATO representatives on the screens before her. The French president had a grim but determined look on his face. He had already pledged French support for the NRF, and then again, of course he did. 
France seemed to be one of the few powers in Europe whose military was ready for such a war, she thought sadly. The Polish representative looked equally grim and determined. Poland was fiercely opposed to Russian aggression, having suffered the brunt of it for centuries. One of her American military contacts had lamented that leaving Poland had for the US military like been leaving a dear friend behind in a bad situation. But other faces she looked at didn't share the same hardened result. Turkey, Hungary, Finland and Sweden, the two newest members who had confidently joined the alliance after the invasion of Ukraine, didn't look ready to honor their commitment to NATO's NRF. Committing the UK would tip the balance, throwing NATO into a full-scale war. Not doing so meant Russia won, and NATO would come apart at the seams as it lost all credibility. All because of one damn village built too close to the Russian border. Clearing her throat, the Britain Prime Minister prepared herself to make history. Gentlemen and ladies, after much consideration, I believe it is in Britain's and Europe's best interest if the British Armed Forces now go check out Could Russia Win a War Against NATO? Or check this other video instead.